colleagues. Um, and I would like to start by giving thanks to Anna Fox and Maria Tapaeva and um, the whole team of uh, Fast Forward for this exciting opportunity to be part of this event. I thoroughly enjoyed the panels of the previous two days and today I'm really looking forward to the discussion after this panel. My research looks closely at a collection of late Soviet private photographs. The photographic objects are positive color slide transparencies shot on 35 millimeter reverse film, 63 units in total, that were authored by and circulated within a small circle of members and friends of a middle class Soviet family um, in the mid 1970s. It also happens to be my mother's extended family. The color transparencies depict women in the countryside posing for the camera in makeshift costumes. In my study of this collection, I seek to analyze the codes of femininity in the images and the context that they come from. In order to do this, I will set the images against the historical background of the late Soviet discourses of gender order and femininity realized through popular culture. Production and viewing of slides was, was a common part of amateur photographic culture during the late USSR, which, uh, with photography being a widespread creative hobby. The practice of slide screenings was common in Soviet households and institutions alike, and employed film projectors such as Etude 2, shown here. Making and screening the images that we see in this study was a summer leisure activity for the family and their friends. The photographer, an elderly woman and close friend of the family, only once appears in the picture. Her models were all females with one exception and all belonged to two generations of the same extended family. The first born in the 1920s, 1930s, the others born in the 1950s. The family belonged um, to the Soviet middle class with a family story rather common for the time. Um, the wife and husband um, had been acquainted since pre-war childhood. After the Second World War, they got married and settled in Feodosia, a seaside town in the Crimea, where young military families were allotted plots of land for residential building and, get and gardening. Like other households in the neighborhood, theirs had no indoor sanitation, was heated in winter by a coal stove, and water was supplied on Tuesdays. The wife of the family studied as a gynecologist and mid midwife, and all her life worked intensively at the local maternity and women's health clinics. The husband was a member of the party and worked as an educator at the children's health camp. The son and daughter, born in the early 1950s, left town after high school for further studies. In the summer, the house hosted extended family and friends who came to the Crimea, a well-known USSR resort for rest and recreation. The family took their guests on day trips to the seaside and mountains. One of the leisure activities on such day trips was making these simple photographic tableau vivant. When put alongside other family photographs from the same archive, we can see how uh, these pictures differ from what is usually referred to as family photography. We can see pictures that can be analyzed as sociograms, as Pierre Bourdieu puts it, in the way that they depict social relations within a group and as acknowledgments of situations constructing the appropriate social experience. However, the slides concerned by this study fall out of this group uh, of exemplary family photographs. First of all, they show nothing of the usual topics of family photography. No family gatherings, no important family events, no tourist snaps in front of a monument. Secondly, the images are sterile in terms of the social specifics of the people posing for the camera. They hide family status, occupation, everyday living conditions and social status under makeshift costumes often made by just draping large pieces of material over the model, model's body. Home surroundings are replaced by picturesque landscape scenery. Finally, in each of these pictures we see a person, but none are portraits of the individuals we see. The people in the pictures are characters put together rather artlessly with simple costumes, stereotypical poses, gestures, and facial expressions. Indeed, in their blatant artificiality, these images reveal the nature of all photography, commonly perceived as images true to life and bearing an imprint of reality. It is essentially never more than a, pre uh, than a representation an alternative reality constructed anew within the image frame. In their research of structures and practices that shaped the gender order in, in the Soviet 
times. This is the spread of the Russian magazine Rabotnitsa in the early 1970s. Um, in their research of uh, structures and practices that shaped the gender order in the Soviet times, Russian researchers Anna Tomkina and Yelena Zdravomyslova argue that, I quote, in general, Soviet patterns of femininity were introduced, controlled, and supported by the party state institution. End of quote. Discourses of femininity and gender were shaped through normative and normalizing statements. In the mid, uh, the mid 1970s are characterized by the revision revision of the women's gender contract. The previous period that started in the 1930s emphasized economic mobilization of women at the background of industrialization and collectivization. In the early 1970s, women in the USSR exceeded men in quantity with a high death rate in adult males due to injury and alcoholism. Women comprised just over 50% of the workforce in agriculture and industry, predominantly light industry. In the, uh, in the 1970s, in an attempt to solve the demographic crisis, the state starts to encourage women to have children while at the same time needing them at work. In order to stimulate growth of the birth rate, state ideology emphasized the idea of motherhood as naturally predestined to women. An important site for the cultural coding of femininity and dissemination of the state ideology of gender order was the popular press. The monthly magazines Rabotnitsa and Kristianka, their titles being feminitive nouns for worker and peasant, respectively, were at the time the most popular of the women's magazines in the USSR. Rabotnitsa boasted over 11 million copies and Kristianka 6.5 million copies in 1970. With no clear distinction of agenda between industry and agriculture, the two magazines covered the same range of topics that were supposed to outline a Soviet woman's range of interests education and choice of profession, professional work, news of industry and agriculture, relationships within the professional collective. As the woman's maternal role was increasingly emphasized, um, the number of publications dedicated to parenting and childcare accordingly increased. The magazines also addressed the cultural background and moral values of the audience. Issues featured short pieces of literature, as well as reproductions of paintings, either of classical pieces from the National Museum collections or contemporary Soviet figurative paintings. Representations of femininity in Rabotnitsa and Kristianka can be summarized as images of the professionally and socially active working mothers. Photographs published in the magazines portrayed women at work and study, meetings, excursions, conferences, enjoying outdoor activities and spending time with their children. The women were often captured in action, were clothed and demonstrated little or no makeup. They were indicated in the captions by profession or name. What was important was their action and agency. While official women's magazines portray a more traditional and somewhat outdated image of a woman as a working mother, the cinema becomes a source of new role models, models and visual codes of femininity. One of the younger women in the uh, images in this study so expresses their fascination with film. I quote, in our thinking of what a woman should be like, we definitely drew on film. We collected postcards with actresses. We went to the cinema and borrowed Sovetsky Ekran, the Soviet screen, uh, the journal, from one another to look at the pictures. And that's how we knew what you want to be and look like a woman. Sovetsky Ekran, the Soviet screen, was at the time the largest and most influential Soviet periodical about cinema. By 1969, it was published in over two million copies. From 1959, it published chronicles of the Moscow International Film Festival, an important cultural and political project that controlled and structured the inevitable inf infiltration of Western mass culture in the USSR. And largely through magazine publications suggested ideologically correct modes of its reception. The journal published portraits of actors and actresses, scenes from films and documentary shots from the festival. The, topic, the topics eventually extended even to previously impossible accounts of famous actors' family lives, the photography um, to showing instant emotions and women's legs. With its direct connections to the side of culture and entertainment and ability to meet interest in new cinematic canons of gender, Sovetsky Ekran may have been a more influential source of gender representation codes that specialized women's magazine, than specialized women's magazines. These processes uh, were simultaneous with the gradual liberalization of gender order that started during Khrushchev thaw. 
the legalization of abortion, the liberalization of divorce procedure, the introduction of mixed gender education, all sought to bring about gender equality and the agency of women. Natalia Lebine, in her research of cultural representation of gender relations in the USSR, argues that charge of the canon, a change of the canons of gender representation was stimulated by the developments of light industry and the introduction of Western culture, films, and literature. The growing openness to Western culture introduced broad Soviet audiences to previously unfamiliar cultural representations of gender, primarily in film and literature. Soviet cinema demonstrated shift to female characters that conformed to the westernization and commodification of popular culture on the one hand, and to the demand for cultural representation of complex interpersonal relationships, search for meaning and difficult moral choice. Back to the images in question. It seems that they have little connection with either cinema or official printed journals. The characters are rather tropes than roles. The inscriptions made by the photographer on several of the slide's cardboard frames laconically tag them as a goddess, a sultan, a bayader, ballet dancer, and Jolly Roger, most likely meaning pirate. Bayader, that is found at least four times in the inscriptions, is the title of one of the most well-known pieces of Soviet ballet and one of the several ballets uh, uh, one of the several ballets that exploited Orientalist aesthetics in what was a story of love and betrayal. Fascination with ballet could possibly be, be one inspiration for the makers of the slides. Indeed, the poses and gestures performed by the models are reminiscent of the poses and gestures established in the classical ballet body language to designate folklore-like specifics of Oriental dance, as we can see them here in stage studio photographs of ballet dancers that were circulated as collectible postcards or illustrated in books uh, or illustrations in books on ballet. Classical ballet, I must say, an opera, were highly esteemed parts of Soviet mass culture. Appreciation of ballet was not only a sign of a cultured person, which a Soviet citizen should aspire to be. Ballet was a symbol of the accessibility of luxury to all people in a socialist state. Along with sports, ballet was one of the rare occasions when a partly disclosed female body could be legitimately displayed in public. Interestingly, interestingly, even though the Orientalism has been traditionally associated with eroticism, the strictly structured corporality of the classical ballet and the emphasis on the strength and craft of the body leaves very little place for it. The avoidance of display of naked female body in the mass culture seems to have left little pressure on the living women's bodies. Although, as a rule, uh, bodies would be closed, clothed in private photography, showing naked skin in the images like this is not a sign of protest against the imposed standards of beauty, but rather a performance of a fantasy of an imaginary world like that of a ballet piece, where the beauty and dance meet in a paradise-like setting and where the everyday is excluded. The only character in this collection with a loose cinematic reference is the Indian. Um, Tatiana Nikolaevna, one of the uh, girls, uh, well, actually, here she is, and that's my mother, recalls, we were, we were walking in the mountains, and the scenery reminded us of a setting of a film about Indians. And Magdalena Andreevna, the photographer, said, let's come back next time and shoot a story about an Indian. I have a sort of a costume, end quote. Rather popular character in the USSR, an American Indian was portrayed in the Soviet culture as a protagonist who rightfully defends his native land from aggressors. This photo session, however, uses the Indian to construct another love story, the only photographic narrative, uh, it, and it is the only photogra photographic narrative within the whole collection. The Indian who captures a beautiful girl and makes her his wife is competing in love with a popular guy who is good at dancing boogie. When the Indian finds out uh, that the girl has been unfair, he kills her. Both male characters in this little tale are played by a woman, but just like odalisks should not be read as protest to imposed beauty standards, the gender cross-dressing has no subtext of queerness, since representations of queerness were omitted in the Soviet mass culture and therefore in the cultural background of the picture makers. What is characteristic of these vernacular visual constructions of femininity? First of all, they have nothing to do with the realities of the creator's lives, neither in the setting nor in social attributes. 
Secondly, they re rely heavily on the notion of outer beauty with an emphasis on the body generated by poses, gestures, and costumes. Finally, they fully correspond to the famous formula women appear, in that the female characters are only pictured posing and not acting, which was uncommon to Soviet mass media that commonly depicted women through their agency and activity. I suggest to read these images as fantasies, the latter to be defined by the notions of staging, performance, symbolism, and pleasure. As Elizabeth Cowie puts in her article Fantasia, fantasy is, I quote, the mise-en-scene of desire, the putting into a scene, a staging of desire, end quote. To understand these pictures as fantasies is to suppose that they find, through performance and visual representation of the performed, a symbolic form for an experience that is otherwise impossible for their creators and sitters. I suggest that some of the prohibited desires that found their symbolic form in these photographs are freedom from, re from the constraints and duties of the everyday by excluding the makers of everyday real life, by choosing exotic and schematic characters and narratives, Self-expression through corporality by decorating the body, use of poses and gestures general, generally not used or approved in everyday life. Erotic power and erotic success by showing naked skin, legitimized by the costumes, by referring to the commonly eroticized orientalist narrative. Thus placing these images in the cultural context of their time reveals that although the creators and users of these photographs were closely familiar with the visual codes of femininity in the popular cinema and press, their choice for the free play expression of femininity is a range of simple, schematic, and exotic characters. Sharing the experience of making and screening the pictures can be regarded as a means of constructing a space of carefully, carefree play and expression, far from the waking mother obligations of the everyday life. One but not the only way to read these tableau vivants can be to regard them as symbolic manifestations of repressed desires and fantasies. They are a bright addition to how we imagine and understand the Soviet everyday through private photographs. I thank you for your attention. And as the last thing, I would like to invite the photography researchers in the room to submit their work to the conference after post-photography um, that I'm organizing with my colleagues in St. Petersburg in 2020.